Okay, okay. so um, Great. everyone, I would like to welcome Professor Elisa uh, Geradoche and her colleagues who are going to talk to us about um, very interesting discoveries in salt factories in Spain. So I leave the mic to you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, hello everyone. Thank you, Karina and Annie, for organizing this workshop and for inviting us to participate. Uh, of course, we would love to be there in Vienna with you. We couldn't make it. Uh, we are very sorry, but thank you very much for letting us to participate um, uh, in virtual mode. Okay, as we don't have much time, I will start straight away and then I will pass on to my colleague, Maria. Uh, in this presentation, we want to show you a collection of uh, ceramic sheds uh, displaying basketry imprints that have been recovered at the Bellvicker salt processing site of Molino Sanchon. Uh, we have analyzed these uh, imprints in order to learn more about the raw materials used in the manufacture of actual baskets. We have uh, studied the different technologies employed and we have made some experimentation to assess the role of baskets in the production of uh, and circulation of salt. Um, finally, we'd like to, to discuss with you the possible connection between baskets, uh, bell beakers, and also salt. So in this uh, slide, we are seeing the site of Molino Sanchon, which is um, located in the northwest part of Spain, in the province of Zamora, at the natural reserve of Las Lagunas de Villa Fafila. Two archaeological campaigns were carried out in 2009 and 2013, and provided solid archaeological evidence for the production of salt by means of the bricketage technique. Next, please. Um, features include uh, wells, pits filled with clay for filtering brackish water, places for boiling the brine, and areas of clay burned red, discarded pottery, ash, and other remains of fire. Next, please, Maria. The boiling areas adopt the form of circle heads acting as trivets as they accommodate some pedestals made of clay or stone and often groups in threes, the function of which was to support over fires the large ceramic vessels containing the salt paste. Taken as a reference point, the technical steps involved in the method of brine boiling, archaeological document throughout prehistoric Europe and also transferred to smaller ceramic molds. And finally, those molds were broken open in order to obtain hard and transportable salt cakes. However, the fact that uh, small pots are very much the exception at Molino Sanchon makes it necessary to contemplate other options when considering how crystallite salt was obtained here. So next, please. It is remarkable to note the presence of hundreds of bell beaker sheds, always corresponding to the Cienpozuelos style, apart from one tiny uh, shed, which is uh, corresponding to the maritime bell beaker style. And uh, we have found um, more or less uh, a hundred uh, thousand sheds uh, from context. Uh, uh, spaces, and I think it's one of the largest collections of bell beakers in Iberia as a whole. Next, please, Maria. So, in comparison to other bright boiling sites in prehistoric Europe, a different modus operandi might have been employed at Molino Sanchon. While unfired red pots or those partially fired are characteristic of European salt factories, vessels of this type are extremely scarce at Molino Sanchon. Large plain vessels seem to have accomplished the transformation of brine into salt paste. This could explain the abundant number of discarded sheds corresponding to pots of considerable quality recover. The results of the fabric analysis on some ceramic samples indicate that the great majority of them underwent a complete firing cycle. Next, please, Maria. Bell beaker pots were not directly involved in the production process, since X ray fluorescent analysis revealed a lower concentration of chlorine than the percentage in the ceramic matrix of the plain pottery. So, in view of the existence of a number of some sheds displaying basketry impression, it is possible that given baskets and textile sacks may have played a role in the production of salt and Molino Sanchon. Okay, next, Maria. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lisa, for this introduction. I will explain now the materials, the methodology, and the 
the results. The sample materials analyzed in the current study is composed of 78 pottery fragments with basketry imprints, which were recovered in the archaeological field works from 2009 and 2013. The methodology consists of the direct analysis of the negative imprints, considering the use of 3D scanner models, the morphotechnical description of the basketry and the identification of the raw materials they were made of, as well as the replication of basketry and theorem prints used as a reference collection. Here you have a video of an artisan who helped us to replicate and doing this reference collection. Uh, although the pods are fragmented, they present a good state of preservation, and some of them present traces uh, of sediment in basketry imprints. Nearly 60% of the imprints are a little bit disseminated, which may be consistent with an intentional smoothing when the clay was still fresh. And in regard to the part of the pot, most of them, um, most of the imprints would be on the base while some profiles in a single case of wall were also detected. detected. Uh, concerning the area with imprints, they can cover partially or totally the surface of the clay, being the total one the sl is slightly more common than the, than the partial one. In five different cases, the center or the initial point of the fiber-based basket is also visible on the clay, and all of them seem to be circular. Um, uh, once imprints on pottery fragments were described, it was important to study what they uh, are showing about the baskets they came from. In this sense, several measures uh, were taken to document the, the variability in the different ways of production. The results uh, showed that all the imprints were made uh, from coil basket item, items, and this technique is based on a bundle of fibers, uh, which is sealed uh, with different stitches, drawing an, an spiral. Differences in these stitches result in technological variability as the spacing between the, the bundles. At least three different ways of stitching have been detected in the samples from Molino Sanchon, which are interlocking, non-interlocking, and intricate. Eight pottery fragments were selected for the study of the plants the baskets were made uh, because they present uh, these vegetal uh, traces inside the imprints. It is difficult to identify the raw material even when you have the direct remains. Thus, the information about um, the plants used in this study is an approximation. Considering the previous archaeobotanical and ecological studies on the site and its immediacies, along with the tradition with the traditional crafting knowledge, a reference collection was made in order to identify the traces on the imprints in high magnitude. These plants include several species and families and were used to, to produce different baskets and also make impressions on clay, on clay to compare to the archaeological ones. The results show that brushes and cereals could be used in the bundles uh, of the baskets, while brushes, cereals, but also cattails or uh, another undeterminated tree bar could be also used for stitching. This experimental approach for documenting the raw material used in Molino Sanchon was also used to hypothesize about uh, how these imprints were made. It has been archaeological proposed that fiber-based mats could be involved in the pottery production processes to make them rest before the clay is completely dry. Following this premise, um, fiber-based mats were used as turntables in the production of pottery pots. The impressions showed differences in the spacing between the bundles, resulting in an open and closed uh, coiled bundles with the same typology of the stitch. This permits us to, to suggest that, this, that, that these differences could be given because of the use of different raw materials. Similar archaeological register has also found in other archaeological sites where basket, basket imprints were detected in pottery fragments and related to this uh, briquette technique of the salt extraction as it is proposed in Molino Sanchon. Moreover, the use of, bus contain bus, uh, of basket containers in traditional salt processing sites is also, is also documented as those ethnographic examples uh, from, the, from the slide. 
referring to this possible role, this possible role of the basket, as well as what has been explained regarding the, the clay fragments with uh, in prints in Molino Sanchon, the hypothesis about the use of baskets in salt extraction has also been experimented. This process would start with the collection of the water, the salt water from the lagoons need to be boiled uh, to, to evaporate the water and concentrate the salt until having a brine. And at this moment, you can uh, follow two different ways of extraction. One consists on continuing, continuing the, to boil the, um, the salt and the water in the pottery, in the pottery pot until the water is completely evaporated. This result, uh, the, the result of this of this process is the extraction of salt, but uh, it has some dirt in the clay, and, and the, the pottery pot uh, is um, broken, and it is possible that it cannot be used anymore. And the second way uh, of salt, salt processing implies the use of a basket that will contain the salt, uh, the salt, and will be placed inside a pottery pot near the heat uh, source till the water evaporates. Following this process, a salt is also obtained with no impurities being the most productive way of salt extraction and obtaining. Okay, so one of the principles in the circulation of salt uh, which has been ethnographical and historically attested to, is that when it is involved in long distance exchanges, it is traded in hot salt cakes as units, as it has been highlighted by Oliver Weller, one of the great specialists in the study of uh, the archaeology of salt. So maritime beakers also meets all of these requirements. Next, please, Maria. So as the beginning of the 20th century, Luis Irret suggested that actual baskets may have been the inspiration for the manufacture of maritime bell beakers, the international styles, as also Professor Kanz has explained in his presentation earlier. So our hypothesis is really an updated version of CIRED proposals. We suggest that maritime beakers imitated organic sachets, organic bags, in which salt was distributed in Western Europe during the third millennium BC. At Molino Sanchon, basket might have served to complete the crystallization process and thus obtain a standardized box intended for salt trade. These packets may have been strung up in wooden structures acting as racks, and hence the presence of a number of pit holes in the excavated areas close to the firing structures. So that is our, our idea, and thank you very much for, for your presentation. So if you have any questions? Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I wonder if we have questions uh, in the public. Um, I don't see hands raising here. Um, maybe I have a question uh, for both of you. Um, so did I understand correctly that this skeuomorphism might indicate that the the maritime vessels, in your opinion, would be used to be this uh, long-term <laughs> continent for uh, for the salt or not at all? Um, I, I might have misunderstood you. <laughs> okay, what we suggest is that uh, maritime diggers were imitating the actual baskets in which salt was protected and also the way in which it was circulated. Because the idea of salt cakes is that they must always be produced in the same shape, in the same unit, um, and also make them uh, hard blocks to facilitate the transport. Because if uh, salt is in powder, it's very difficult to, to trade it. So uh, maritime diggers always reproduce the same shape they are a standard production, always in uh, reddish or um, orange uh, colors, like imitation of, of actual baskets. And if we think of the distribution uh, of maritime beakers from the supposedly origin of the maritime style, at least the, the Extremadura Portuguesa area, we see also the same area of distribution of salt, even during the modern times. 
in which uh, Portuguese salt was distributed to Northern Europe, even though they already have uh, salt there. But it seems that Portuguese salt was um, more uh, valuated there. <laughs> Um, but then I, my follow-up question, if this is what you mean, is uh, we've seen this image, uh, quite impressive, of the destruction that the salt brought to that vessel uh, within which it was dried. So this is a, a newbie question, maybe this is obvious, but um, is it, uh, would, it, would that leave marks also if, so the salt was then uh, exported somewhere else within these beakers? Would, wouldn't these uh, beakers bear the marks of this salt uh, inside, if if it has such a corrosive uh, um, aspect to it, as far as I know, only one maritime beaker has provided traces of salt. It comes from a um, Neolithic uh, burial mound in Galicia, in northwestern part of Iberia. But as far as I know, uh, I I don't know any other beaker um, related directly to to salt. Okay. <laughs> Can I hear that? <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, it hi. Was, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, it was really great. Um, I'm, I'm, as you might know, I have worked together with uh, someone from uh, Jena because they have um, those uh, bricketage in large um, numbers. Um, it's, it's from late Bronze Age and, and early Iron Age. And sometimes they also found some textile traces in the briquetage, but just sometimes. And then we did uh, some uh, deliberate um, experiments. And really, as you said, it's easier to take out the salt when you when you had a, a textile divider between <laughs> the, um, the the briquetage and and the salt itself, because otherwise it just <laughs> melts into the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we also published that. It's if, if you're interested, if you don't know. That. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Okay. It was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we stay in contact. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come around somewhere? Because we always have our experimental archaeology um, uh, workshops in Aspen an der Zeia. It's the Open Air Museum. Also, Franz Pieler is here and he could uh, provide you some, you could. Yeah, stay there for a workshop and just try everything out with a bigger setting because we have a lot of students who are also there and they can, yeah, also help. That means you could make these experiments right. in, in a bigger scale if you want. It would be at the end of, oh yeah, maybe everyone who is interested in experimental archaeology just feel invited. Yeah. Hello, um, I didn't come on the list. Um, you would be very welcome uh, if you want to um, come around uh, in end of June. We have a four days workshop on experimental archaeology and uh, salt production. We had that earlier, but it's basically Iron Age. Uh, so a bell beaker salt production would be, well, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it would be great to have it. <laughs> So, but it needn't be confined only to the end of June. So, I mean, we operate all year round. So, if you would, if it's like October, it would be more suitable for you. We'll, we'll keep in contact. We stay in, in touch anyway, and uh, we can arrange that as well. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, we have, it seems that we have one online question. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Okay, so I think this is, um, I don't know if you can, if you can read it in the chat, Elisa. A yes, question, it a be question from containers for a basket of brine and evaporating juice spit. No, um, we don't think that bell beaker pottery will, was directly used in the production of or processing of, of brine. Um, uh, in the case of Molino Sanchon, all the site is completely flooded with brackish water during the rainy season, more or less between October and April, is completely flooded. Okay, but the percentage of chlorine is different between the different pro ceramic productions of the site. So we have Real brick attach, not very represented at the site, less than 1%. Then a lot of plain pottery and also bell beakers. So 
um, supposedly the level of chlorine should be the same in the different uh, these three types of production. But surprisingly, the level of chlorine is much lower in the bell beaker sheds. So it seems that all of this production was covered with the same saline um, environment, but uh, bell beaker was not directly used in the processing of brine. I don't know if um, that. Thank you for that precision. And I think we uh, have, unfortunately, to go, well, not unfortunately, we have to go for lunch. <laughs> well, have fun. I'm sure that Maria and the rest of my colleagues and me would love to be there with you. So thank you very much for inviting us and, and enjoy the, the rest of the workshop. Thank yes. you, Karina and Eve. Thank you. Thank you very much.